you very much, Reverend Patterson, for the invitation to get to come and see each of you in Cookstown here this morning. Um, it's a long time since we've been back here in Northern Ireland. It's actually been six years since we were last home, and so it's just lovely to be able to be with you all again and to be able to share of what the Lord has done for us in these past years. Since it's been so long since we've actually been here with you, I thought I would give a little bit of just a, an overview of our, our life and ministry, and as the older we get, um, the more complicated it is to be able to share. It's 20 years since Danny and I graduated from our mission training and began our ministry with New Tribes Mission and New Tribes Mission of course um, has a ministry to the unreached people of the world people who have never had the opportunity to hear the gospel because they live in such remote areas and um, when Danny and I got married 20 years ago that we felt the Lord was leading us to um, the islands of the Philippines and after learning the national language and culture for two years in Manila we moved into into the island of Palawan um, amongst the central Tagbanwa people and um, we don't just learn the national language but we also want to learn the culture of the people that we live amongst it's one thing to be able to communicate the word of God but to live in such a way that they actually want to listen to us is a whole different thing and so we lived into a little village where people were rice farmers and fishermen and had a very 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 simple way of life and it was our great joy to get to live amongst them and these people we flew in in a, a little airplane in a grass airstrip and I am not I'm from Dungannon I'm not a big adventurous person and the Lord had to really teach me so much about trusting in him even just to get into this plane and arrive in the middle of the jungle there were days I definitely thought Lord how did I get here this is not the life that I thought I was going to be living and in, actually in the early days there was a lot of fear in my life as I lived our life out there um, but a verse that the Lord brought into our lives and challenged Danny and I right from the beginning when we moved into this village and it's 1 Thessalonians 2 8 so being affectionately desirous of you we were willing to have import, imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. And that's the more we got to know the people and the culture there, the more we, they became so dear to us. And it wasn't just sharing this message and the gospel, it was sharing our very lives with them. And that was a wonderful privilege to get to share the Lord Jesus Christ with people who lived in fear, fear of spirits, always trying to appease the spirits and um, to keep their children well and visiting the witch doctor and just so much fear in their lives on a daily level. The devil has really lied to people who live far away in these remote places that have never had a exposure to the truth of God's word and it's very sad to see how they live their daily lives in so much fear. In April of 2007 after language learning and culture learning um, New Tribes Mission because these people have never heard anything um, have not heard the word of God taught clearly um, we start in the book of Genesis with creation and who God is, the character of God and the redemption story all the way through to the cross. And it takes months to do that. We met two or three times a week, gathering the people together and just teaching story by story, building a foundation for them to come to the understanding that they are sinners that are separated from God. But God has been pleased to send his only son as the perfect sacrifice for their sins and by faith in God alone they could come to have peace with God and to be able to share the redemption story with people that have never heard was just one of the greatest privileges of our lives to see people come to know Jesus as savior people who once went to witch doctors and sacrificed so their rice would grow were now worshiping and thanking God to provide their every needs and you know as Danny and I and our co-workers were a team of co-workers out there the more that we spent time with these people the more we were growing in our faith and our walk with the Lord too the Lord taught us so much and um, I had the privilege out there I remember a few weeks after the teaching had had been done and we had this group of little believers 
and life's very busy out there. We run medical programs and just live in your daily life. You know, you're cooking from scratch, you're doing your laundry in an old spinner washing machine. Everything takes so much time. And a group of ladies came to me just a few weeks after and they said, we're, we've figured out a time and Wednesdays at three o'clock will work really good for you to start teaching us all. I had a few days to start preparing, but that Wednesday at three o'clock, became one of my favorite times in the village when these group of ladies gathered together to, to learn the word of God for the very first time. Um, sorry, I'm flipping through here. Danny and the other two co-workers taught weekly in church, but discipleship was so much part. The Great Commission tells us to go and to teach and also to baptize and discipleship is so much part of the Great Commission. And so spending time in houses, some people wanted to go over things more, some people were having difficulty understanding, but just spending time with the people there was a real joy and something we're so grateful for. We were there for 12 years, teaching many times a week, spending time with the people, three couples. And uh, then the time came to appoint elders and deacons, and they started to take over the teaching more and more. And us ladies, we trained the Sunday school teachers, and they were teaching Sunday school. And our last year or two while we were there, we were needed less and less, which is a wonderful thing. It's what we've been trained to do, is as church planters, to go in and to establish a church and to train them so that when we're no longer there, their church can continue to function. And we praise the Lord that the day did come when we said goodbye. And um, we had been there for 12 years, as I say, and uh, they supported us fully. They said, thank you for coming. Thank you for bringing the gospel. But they knew that there were great needs all around the Philippines still. Many, many groups and villages that have never, ever, ever had the chance to hear the news of the gospel. So as much as they loved us being there, as much as it was security in many ways for meeting a lot of their medical needs and other needs, they didn't want to hold on to us when they knew there was other people that still needed to hear the gospel. So in 2017, after being on the island of Palawan, our children were born there. It was very much home to us. In 2017, we headed up north, and instead of a little airplane flying in, we knew that now was a helicopter. Again, another adventure for Philippa to have to trust the Lord. And it sounds very exciting, but for me, it was all a, just a step-by-step -step in faith. And um, we had a little house in there that was had been a single lady's house, a tiny, tiny little cabin. But we were just so grateful to have any place. And we moved into a new village. There had been missionaries in this village for 10 years, but one of the most spiritually dark places we had ever visited in the Philippines. And um, we joined that work there. And as we moved in, they had a cult in there that had a medium. And every week we would hear the people gathering together and the medium would call down spirits and people would have seizures, children would pass out. It was a very, very dark village to live in. Now, when Danny and I first moved into the first village, we were in our 20s, um, very young, very inexperienced. And I remember being very, very fearful, thinking, Lord, this is a huge undertaking to go into this village and learn a language and a culture and learn about how they live. How are we ever going to get to the point? We are so weak. I am so inadequate. This just feels too much for me to be able to do this. And the Lord give us strength day by day to keep trust in him and to be faithful and to just... Um, just trust him to get through each day. And after being there for all those years and seeing a church established and people coming to know the Lord as our savior, we left that first work not confident in and of ourselves. I still felt totally weak and unable to do anything um, like that going into a remote village, but we were absolutely confident that the Lord could use us even despite our weaknesses, that the Lord and his word going forth by the power of the Holy Spirit can change people's lives. And it's not relying on Danny Philippa. It's us being faithful and available to the Lord. And it's his word and his spirit that changes people's lives. So when we walked into this second village, again, I was absolutely overwhelmed. This was our second language, Ilocano. And we started again, but there was a real boldness in our hearts when we could hear the medium calling 
fallen down spirits. We thought, Lord, we're here to proclaim your word and we're going to do it in any way we can. And the people there opened their doors immediately to us. We were adopted into a family there and they came and they shared everything with us from their time to their dinner, which was sometimes buffalo lung or bats or all sorts of things. And we just said, thank you. And then we welcomed them into our house and got to share our food like chicken and turkey (laughs) and more normal things with them. But it was just a joy once again to share our lives together. And uh, something that really encouraged us too during this time, our children were born out in the Philippines and in the first work they were born into a church. And I remember when we moved into the second work that very first Sunday, you know, we get into the rhythms of our, our weeks and here we have the joy every Sunday morning. Sunday is a different day. You get up and you get ready to come to church. And I remember that first Sunday morning in the village, we were around our little breakfast table and uh, as he said, Mom, are we going to go to church today? And I said, sweetheart, there is no church here. That's why we're here. And just the silence of not being able to go to church really impacted our children too, that these people really have no opportunity to hear about God. And that's something in Northern Ireland is a very foreign concept to us. And something that I hope that we take as a great privilege and something we are so grateful for, that we have the opportunity every week to come and listen to the word of God. That we have the opportunity to read this Bible in our own language. And something the Lord really taught me, you know, the word of God was always an authority in my life. But watching people go through the word of God for the first time, to go through the book of Acts and Romans and understand it for the first time, the Lord really gave me an affection for his word. It's not just something that we're to obey, which it's very important, but it's something we're to desire and to delight in and to appreciate that our Heavenly Father has given us his word because he wants to communicate with us. And uh, our kids really noticed These people don't know. And I remember one day Isabella running out with her little storybook Bible in a different language trying to say that Jesus had come to save them. And we thank the Lord for how the Lord has helped our children grow too in their desire um, to want to be missionary kids. As many of you know then, in 2008, while we were living in that village, one day Danny came in and had found a tumor on his hip. And I'm not gonna get into that whole story today. I'm sure next month at your ladies meeting and I'll share more of that story with the ladies during that time. But we had to come back to the States and we left our little house with one suitcase and we never made it back to that little house and to the people there. And in 2018, Danny went through a terrible year of chemo and radiation and two operations. But we thank you today for praying for us. Thank you that you prayed during that time and we praise the Lord that he restored Danny's health. And at the end of 2018, we had the opportunity to then move to Missouri. Missouri is where we went through our missionary training. And while Danny had ongoing scans and we waited to see what the Lord's will was for his life, we had the opportunity to go back to the training where 200 students came through in our time there and we got to pour into their young lives and teach them and encourage them in this wonderful privilege of being a missionary. And um, we really thank the Lord during that time for what he taught us and we really enjoyed the mission missionary training center we really could they asked us to stay there and we really loved the ministry but during that time I'm just going to read one final verse here as I come to a close on my little time but in Acts chapter 20 verse 24 it says but none of these things move me neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And during that time, the Philippines still had many great needs. We praise the Lord that while we were in America, another couple moved into our little house and the work there amongst the Gatang work continued. But Danny and I were at a place to think, what what does the Lord have for us? 
and the Philippines leadership asked us to come back and have a, a leadership role with a lot of responsibilities to all the tribal works in the Philippines that we'd come in. And Danny will be a church planting director and um, we have a lot of surveys to do, a lot of responsibility to find other villages and other works and to train new missionaries coming to go and to reach these works. So we're going back with a great responsibility. Our first work was on the Middle Island. We spoke Tagalog there and then the second work was up north and we spoke Ilocano up there and we're going back to learn our third language of Visayan and we're now in our mid-40s so we're just praying that the Lord will allow us to absorb another language but we have wee prayer cards that I'm going to leave at the back and if you would pray right now the Philippines borders are closed and we can't get back we're here for a few months in Northern Ireland but we would love the borders to be able to open again so not only we but other missionaries who are waiting to get back can get back to the places where people are still waiting to hear the Word of God and we take that as a huge responsibility but over the years the longer we serve the Lord as that whole that old hymn goes the longer I serve him the sweeter he grows that is definitely our test testimony when we thought Danny would not be able to continue on in life or ministry the Lord realized what a gift it is you know I set off 20 years ago as a great sacrifice to serve the Lord but if that's what the Lord wanted me to do I would do but over the years I've realized what a gift the Lord gave to me and allowing me to go to bring the gospel to people who had never heard. But also the very last verse of the Great Commission says, and lo, I am with you always. And to have known the Lord and his grace in my life so tenderly and so kind has been just a life-changing experience for me. So I just thank the Lord today for the call to be able to go and serve him. First, I'd like to start off by saying thank you, Reverend Patterson, just for the opportunity for Philip and I to come and, and share with you this morning. Um, and I'd also like to thank every single one of you who have prayed for us over the last few years as, as the Lord was doing some things in my life that he knows I would have never purposely walked into, and yet he allowed those things to take place and going through the cancer. Uh, and I just praise the Lord for so many times where we're getting encouraging information during that time and people were saying, hey, uh, the, the people at this church are praying for you and the people at Cookstown are praying for you. And, and it was those times where in the middle of that, the Lord encouraged our hearts greatly and we didn't know how it was going to turn out, but we knew that God's people were going before the throne of grace on our behalf and we knew that we have a gracious God who listens and cares. And so it was just so encouraging to come through that and to be able to stand before you now. Philip and I would have never waited six years if it was our choice to be here. Um, but nevertheless, here we are today. And uh, I just want to start off with a passage today the Lord's put on my heart. This passage is in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. And I'll start off by reading it this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. And the Apostle Paul says this, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved, and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life, and who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. And I trust that the Lord will bless the reading of his word to our hearts this morning. Let's open up in our word of prayer. Dear God, Father, we just humbly come before you and we thank you for the honor and privilege of being yours. We do not deserve to be here today. We do not deserve to be worshiping you. And yet you in your grace and your mercy has pursued us who are sinners right from the beginning all the way to Calvary so that you could redeem us to yourself and make a people unto yourself, a people who would know you and love you and worship you. And that is who we are today. And we thank you for the honor and the privilege of being yours. 
We just ask this morning that your Holy Spirit would be with us, that your Holy Spirit would be taking and using your word, that you would challenge and convict and encourage, and that you would increasingly help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And so, God, we thank you as we come into your word this morning. We desire nothing more than for you to be glorified. Amen. So in this passage, verse 14, Paul starts off with saying, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph. And this is something indeed to be thankful for, to be grateful for. And yet at the same time, as you go into the Greek, this idea of causing us to triumph can be a little bit more literally interpreted as leads us in triumph. And so, now thanks be to God, which always leads us in triumph. And to us, we're thinking of different things when we hear this phrase. But as Paul is saying this to the Corinthian church, Paul is using a metaphor that he knows culturally is going to spark a whole myriad of images in their mind when he uses the phrase, lead us to triumph. Now to us, we don't get that. It doesn't come screaming out of the passage, but to them, they are Roman citizens who were living in the Roman Empire. And so when he talks about this triumph, this whole passage is drawing a picture of a Roman triumph or a Roman triumphal march. And what was happening here is Rome would send their armies and they would go off out through the empire ever expanding their borders and they would go off and they would conquer new people, conquer new lands. And as they would come back victorious, they would come through the cities, this victorious army marching back to Rome. And as they came back to Rome, they're entering the city and you would have the king and the general at the very front of this procession. It would be this huge parade. And as they start marching through the cities, this triumphal procession, there would be wave after wave of rolling stages they would have great pictures of the battles and the cities that had been conquered as they were going through the people would be lining the sides of the streets to catch a glimpse of this victorious king and this victorious army and at the front you would have the emperor or the general and then you'd have the soldiers and then there'd be carts of loot that they'd been taking from all over the empire where they've uh, sacked different cities and things like that and these would be filled with spices and other things and then you would have captives you would have the captive kings and their courtesans and then you would have uh, some of their famed soldiers and mighty soldiers and they would be there as captives and on the side of the streets you would have people and part of the celebration and they're they have incense that they're kind of lighting up and so there's just this aroma that's going throughout the whole procession as everybody's celebrating and they're making their way up to the Colosseums where those who have been taken captive more than likely were going to be put to death in the Colosseum. And so when they talk about a triumphal procession or leading in triumph, this is the image that is going to be in their mind. With that we want to move into what Paul then starts describing and talking about with this is the metaphor or the image that he is bringing about here. He says, now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph or leads us in triumph in Christ. And so as he talks about this idea of an earthly king or an earthly general who would be leading in triumph, obviously there are earthly kings taking place or going off to earthly battles against earthly enemies. But here he says that we are being caused to triumph or being led in triumph in Christ. So we have Christ who is our king, Christ who is the one who is going before us into battle, Christ is the one who is gaining victory. And it is not an earthly battle or an earthly enemy that we are fighting against. So as we go back through scripture and we start thinking through, then who is this victory over? What is this victory that Christ has possessed for us? And we start going back all the way to Genesis chapter 3. 
We see the right from the beginning that God who has loved us from the beginning, he loved us through how he created everything, provided everything for us, created mankind in his own image, in his own likeness, so that we could know him, so that we could talk to him, so that we could worship him. And Satan, right from the beginning, who has hated God, hates everything that God loves. And so in Genesis chapter 3, we see Satan coming along trying to ruin that relationship. And he goes and he tempts Eve and he tries to manipulate her into thinking differently about God. And she is tempted and she listens to Satan and Adam then listens to his wife. And rather than living in a relationship of dependence and love on God, the one who made them and has provided everything for them, they followed Satan. They followed Satan's pride and they chose to disobey. And right there at the beginning, Satan has struck the first blow. That Satan is this great enemy who has been fighting against God. And it would be at this stage that as they decide to walk away from God, as it were, to not live in dependence on God, that this result to mankind is physical death. Things started to decay. They didn't drop dead right away, but they started to die. Then it was relational separation from God. And then it is eternal separation from God. And those things didn't just happen to them, but they were passed on to their descendants on and on to us. And so Satan, probably in full joy, was ecstatic that he had ruined God's plan, ruined what God uh, has desired right from the beginning. And at a time where Adam then realizes the depth of his sin and is moved by shame to hide from God, at this point we would think, They've lost hope. They've lost relationship. They've lost an eternal relationship with their creator. And it is right here where if God wanted to, it would have made perfect sense with human reasoning that God could have said, look, you didn't want me. You didn't want a relationship with me. Fine, go your own way. I want nothing to do with you. But that is not what happened, is it? We see that in Genesis 3.15, in a moment where there is no hope, God brings hope, and he offers what is called the Proto-Evangelion, which means the first gospel. And Genesis 3.15 says this. Genesis 3.15 says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise its heel. And this is the first promise, the first declaration of a Messiah coming, of a Redeemer coming, of one who would strike a blow to Satan. God says that he will put enmity between thy seed and her seed. In the Hebrew, her seed is singular. It is not talking about all of mankind. It is not talking about all of her descendants. It is talking about one specific descendant that will come. And it says that it shall bruise thy head, speaking of this one descendant. One day there was going to be a descendant who is going to bruise or crush Satan's head. And thou shall bruise his heel, saying that Satan is going to strike a blow on this descendant's heel, but it is not going to be a mortal wound. And this is a promise right from the beginning that this battle between Satan and God will one day come to an end and it's going to come to an end through a Messiah, through a Redeemer. And so right from this point on, Satan knew that something was coming, that God had this plan, that God was going to restore what Satan thought that he had torn apart. And as we start going through Scripture, you can go story after story of seeing how Satan has been against God's people. I think of Satan uh, attempting to destroy Israel through their slavery in Egypt. That Satan put it in Pharaoh's mind to kill every male child. And yet somehow God rescued Moses, and we know that story very well. And Moses was able to grow up and be used to restore and rescue Israel from Egypt. 
We go through to stories like King Herod, hearing that there was going to be a king of the Jews born in Bethlehem. And again, Satan put it on his mind to then destroy and kill, kill all the male children in Bethlehem. And yet, what did God do? He saved Jesus. You go on through stories where Satan then takes Jesus away when he hears John the Baptist declare that this is the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. That Satan then in the next story in scripture takes Jesus off into the wilderness to tempt him like he tempted Eve. To try to get Jesus to move in dependence on him rather than dependence on the Father and yet he fails. We then see that Satan starts to increase dramatic demonic activity around the ministry of Jesus throughout the Gospels. We see that Satan starts using the Pharisees to reject Jesus as Messiah, to teach against him, and ultimately to plot his death. We see Jesus then use Judas to try and betray Jesus. And we can only imagine, Scripture doesn't explicitly say anything but we can only imagine the joy when satan sees jesus on the cross dying thinking to himself that this battle that has taken place for over four thousand years is finally culminating in god's messiah god's redeemer now being killed and yet at the same time the horror he must have felt when he realized that god has raised it's Jesus from the dead. That Jesus has conquered death. He has conquered the power of sin. And what he has done is paid the price of my sin and your sin so that he could redeem us back to him and replace us to the relationship that he has always desired with us from the very beginning. And this is the battle that he is talking about, that he has won for every single person who places their faith in Jesus Christ. We now have fellowship with God the Father. That we are told in Hebrews chapter 4 that because of Christ, we can boldly walk before the throne of grace. And that was achieved by the victory of Christ. And so he says to us in verse 14, Now thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. So in this whole picture of this royal triumph, that there are people walking in the parade, and on the sides there's this incense that is being given off. And Jesus is saying, through the apostle Paul, that through this triumph and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. That as we as the church of Jesus Christ are living our life, are walking in faith, are walking in obedience, and as we are declaring the gospel of the grace of Jesus Christ, that as it were, there is this essence, this scent, this, this savor that is coming from us and it is impacting the world around us. That we are not just living through life and having no impact. That he describes a savor or a scent coming from us as we walk faithfully, as we walk in obedience, and as we declare the gospel or the knowledge of God to the world around us. He then continues on with this idea of a savor in verse 15. And he says, for we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. And he pulls this idea of a sweet savor from Old Testament sacrificial uh, language. We look at Genesis chapter 8 verses 20 through 21. And it's the story of Noah. And he comes off of the ark. And one of the first things that he does and it doesn't say how soon, but he builds an altar. And on that altar, he offers every clean animal and every clean fowl as a burnt offering on the altar. And in verse 21, it says, and the Lord smelled a sweet savor. Ephesians 5, 2 says, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. So he says in verse 15, for we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. I personally am not the sweet savor. 
My good works are not the sweet savor. If I had all the religious activity in the world, that would not be the sweet savor. That does not make God happy. My actions, my, my religious duties, that does not bring joy in and of itself to God. What he's saying here, though, is that for we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. The Bible says that from the moment we place our faith in Christ, our position is in Christ. And so because we are in Christ, his sacrifice was pleasing to God. God was happy with Jesus, and therefore because we are in Christ Jesus, God is happy with us. And so as he's talking about this metaphor and this picture, he's saying that as we live our lives in obedience and as we live our lives in our testimony and as we share the gospel, all of these things are this savor that is going off to the world around us. And the fact that we are also in Christ, that this savor is being offered up to God and it is a sweet smelling savor only because we are in Christ. But this has a reaction to the world around us. Let's look at the second part of verse 15. It says, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. Going into verse 16, To the one we are a savor of death unto death, and to the other we are a savor of life unto life. And as we start looking at the reaction that our life has, that others around us as it were, are going to be getting a sense of the savor of our life. They are going to be smelling this savor that we are giving off in the imagery that he is giving, that we are going to have an impact, that people will respond to us. And they're going to respond in one of two ways. He says that people are not going to be neutral with God. Right, That as we live our lives and as we are faithful to the Lord and as we share the gospel, there is no middle ground. That people cannot claim to spiritually be Switzerland with God. That we can't say, look, God, I'm not for you, but I'm not against you either. I'm just going to be this good person who tries to do good things and someday you are going to allow me to come to heaven because of my goodness. That there's no place for that in scripture. And there's no place for that in the metaphor that Paul uses either. He uses this metaphor of a conqueror and those who are associated with him who are victorious and those who are the captured, those who are the conquered, who were then going off, more than likely being led to death. That's what's taking place here. And so there are those, as he goes through here, he says in verse 16, the one... We are a savor of death unto death, and the other a savor of life unto life. So here's what happens as we live our lives for Jesus Christ, as we walk in faithfulness, as we walk in obedience, and as we share the gospel, there are going to be those out there in the world who hear this message, who see our testimonies, and the Holy Spirit then takes that and uses that in their life and convicts them of their sin, convicts them of their need for a Savior, and they respond in faith. They want to know Jesus. They want to love Jesus. They want to be saved. They want to be with him for all of eternity, and God saves them and redeems them and makes him his and yet others will see the exact same testimony, see exactly how we live our lives, hear the exact same gospel message. And Paul describes this as a scent of death unto death. They do not want to be saved. They do not want to admit they're sinners. They do not want to live in dependence on God. And so they reject him and they reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one of the incredible things that comes out of this is the idea that God will ultimately give us what we want. Right? That might sound a little bit off. But for the sinner who knows that they're a sinner, for the sinner who desires to be forgiven their sin, who desires to be saved, who desires to know and love and walk with Jesus and be with him for all eternity, God has done everything needed for that to be possible. And so if you love and want Jesus Christ, 
Jesus Christ will be the reward of your faith. And yet for the person who does not want Jesus Christ, for the person who does not want to repent, they do not want to be saved, they do not want a relationship with God, God ultimately will give them what they want. See, the world tends to paint this picture of God as he's some mean, capricious God who forces people to go to hell. Well, he doesn't. He's done everything needed for people to not go to hell. For people to be his and be his for all of eternity. But at the same time, he will not force anyone to place their faith in him. He will not force anyone to be eternally with him. And so if somebody's heart desire from beginning to end is to reject God, to live for themselves, to love their sin and continue in it, ultimately God's going to say, if that is what you want, that's what you get for eternity. You don't want me. I'm not forcing myself on you. And so this verse 16 talks about these two different groups, those who hear the gospel message, those who see our testimonies, and they want Jesus Christ. And this second group who hear the same, and they respond out of rejection. They do not want Jesus Christ. He then says at the second half of verse 16, and who is sufficient for these things? And the answer is, I'm not. When we look at this passage, we're seeing a list of responsibilities here. My responsibility, as somebody who is in this triumphal procession, as it were, my responsibility is to live my life and say, look at the one who's victorious. Look at Jesus Christ who has done everything and he has conquered and by grace he has saved me and he brings me with him and we get to live in a way where our lives scream of the goodness and the might and the majesty and the grace and the mercy of Jesus. And we get to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's where our responsibility ends. When people start thinking about, okay, their response, right? Sometimes people are terrified to share because what if they reject me? They're not rejecting me, they're rejecting God. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting Jesus Christ. And when he asks who is responsible for these things or as it were who is sufficient for these things it is not me that we are to do what we are responsible for and the holy spirit will take that and he will do what he is responsible for jesus will do what he is responsible for he then picks this up and keeps going with it in verse 17 and he says for we are not as many which corrupt the word of god but as of sincerity but as of god in the sight of god Speak we in Christ. So here's what he's saying. He's saying when it comes to how we live and what we share from the word of God, there's a huge responsibility, right? If I in fear am tempted to somehow change the gospel message so that I don't offend somebody, right? If I try to change it so it becomes a little bit more palatable to the world out there, then I am messing with the truth of God's word, and that can be a very scary thing. And in the same way that if I am trying to evoke a response in somebody else's life, that's not my job, that's not my responsibility, but if I'm trying to use the word of God to bludgeon them into some kind of response, to manipulate them into some kind of response, I am walking outside of any realm of responsibility that God has given me. And that also can be a very scary thing. So we as messengers, we as the church, we as the ones who have God's spirit and are responsible for reaching out, for declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ through our lives and through our message, he says, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. What he's saying is that as we share the word of God, we need to do so flavored with much grace and never skimping on the truth. That just as Christ showed love and grace to me when I didn't deserve it, that should be my attitude towards those who are lost in their sin. And yet at the same time, not protect them from the truth and the reality of the message of the gospel and the ultimate judgment that is to come. Not being overly heavy or overly light on either one of those. So I just want to end here with these thoughts in this picture 
we're in this parade. We're in this triumphal procession. And yet, yes, we are celebrating what Christ has done for us, but we have this responsibility. How we live our lives absolutely matters. How we speak to those that the Lord brings into our life, it really matters. That some of us have children and we have the responsibility to live and model in a way what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And we have the responsibility to be sharing and going after their hearts and discipling them into what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Others, it's neighbors, it's people we work with. God is going to be faithful to be bringing people into our life. And we might not even know who it is at any given time. But all we need to know is right now, right where I am at today, I've got a responsibility to live in a way that glorifies Christ in the small, quiet, mundane moments of life where I think I'm on my own or somebody else isn't going to see me, I still need to be the sweet-smelling savor of the change that God has brought about through his gospel. And I need to be prepared to share this gospel at any given moment. So the question is, are we living that way? Maybe an odd question might be, what savor is our life giving off? What scent are people catching from us? Are they going to be responding negatively because of how I live? Not because of the truth of scripture? Or are they going to be seeing our life and hearing the truth of the gospel and seeing that that is a life that has changed and in line with the truth of the gospel and they want that and God can use that message in their life? And that is something that only I can answer for myself. And it is something that I have to wrestle with daily, constantly. It's not a one-off decision. But it's this incredible message that God is bringing us into this procession and how he wants to reach the entire world through the lives and through those that he is bringing into the sphere of our lives. So I will just end it there. And again, thank you so much for allowing me to come and, and to be here and to share with you this morning. Thank you, Danny, for the challenge of the Word of God this morning. And may God bless it to us. I'm sure that the Lord has spoken to us and would I challenged each one of us we're going to conclude our service with just two verses of our closing hymn. I'd ask the question, is you're all on the altar? And I trust today that we can lift up our hands and say, yes, Lord, our lives are on the altar for you. Let's stand as we sing just the two verses. <laughs>
Father, we can honestly say this morning that it's been good for us to have been here. And we thank you for your word and for the challenge of your word, Lord. And I pray that our testimonies will be such that they are uh, glorifying to you, Lord, that others will take knowledge that have been redeemed out of the slave market of sin. Thank you for uh, who you are. Thank you so many of us can say that we're in Christ today. And with Christ in the vessel, we're going to smile at the storm as we go marching home. Thank you too for the report that Philip has brought to us, Lord, and again for the challenge of it. And I just pray that you'll continue to be with your children and bless Danny and Philip's family. Pray for Billy and Jennifer, Lord, that you will be with them even at this time. No doubt precious weeks with their family. And I just pray, O oh God, that your blessing will be upon each one of us, buried in your presence, that whatever our needs might be, that we might look to you, because you are a wonderful, wonderful Saviour. Thank you for being with us. Pray for your blessing upon us as we go on our onward journey. In the Saviour's name we pray. Amen. Well, Danny and Philip are going to go to the door. I just say goodbye to you as you leave today. And thank you again for coming. And may God bless you.